Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Anxiety Rx podcast. I am very excited to have an old friend on today who's, uh, who's very versed in different methods of, of treating different conditions. He's a, a fertility specialist. Uh, I'll read his bio here. Dr. Lauren Brown is a director or is doctor of traditional Chinese medicine, a clinical hypnotherapist, and recognized as a pioneer in the field of fertility and reproductive health. As the clinical director of AcuBalance Wellness Center, located in beautiful Vancouver, Canada, which I've been many times, he has dedicated his career to helping individuals and couples achieve their dreams of parenthood. With a passion for advancing fertility care, Dr. Brown has held the esteemed position of past chair of the Integrative Fertility Syndrome Symposium. Man, I can't even talk today. Past chair of the Integrative Fertility Symposium and is committed to integrative and holistic approaches to fertility. Dr. Brown is also the host of the popular Conscious Fertility Podcast, where he shares his wealth of knowledge and insights with a global audience. Among his notable achievements, Dr. Brown pioneered the practice of on-site IVF acupuncture and low-level laser therapy for fertility support in Vancouver, revolutionizing the way fertility treatments are approached and elevating success rates for his patients. So, Dr. Brown, welcome. We've talked about this for a while. You know, hearing the bio, it's interesting. You think it's... It's all about fertility, yet probably over 50% of the people I see now are not trying to grow their families. They're just trying to um, have less or no anxiety and join their life. Obviously, I see the fertility group still, but sure. hearing my bio, I was like, ah, it's how things have evolved over the years. Time to update. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and you and I, like when you when we met like 10 years ago, when I was at the dark night of my soul and you were struggling with anxiety as well. Yeah. I remember that. So we would have conversations in Vancouver just about, you know, what was going on. I, and I, you know, you and I have both expanded our knowledge so much in the last 10 years that I thought it'd be great just to have you on the podcast and talk about your experience with anxiety, healing it. And, and, you know, we have slightly different perspectives on it. So I thought it would be great to just talk about how we each handled our anxiety, how it kind of went up, how it went down, what worked, what didn't work, that kind of thing. And, and you and I are both kind of, we're not anti-traditional medicine. We just sort of see the limitations of traditional medicine. Yeah, and that's, it's, a, that's a good yeah. point because we're, we're, not, we're not anti. I, I like integration, um, and yet we know it's incomplete and that mm -hmm. there's other ways to heal. And so we're open to going outside the box to um, find that healing because the box didn't work for us. <laughs> right. So That's otherwise exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Like I, I used to get letters when I was a, a GP about um, psychiatrists sending me letters that said, oh, the patient failed uh, antidepressant therapy. It's like, what? Mm -hmm. The patient failed? It's like, no, I think antidepressant therapy failed the patient. I think that's what yeah. happened. Uh, yeah. And the way we frame things in medicine is like, well, not our fault. Yeah. So there's definitely limitations to, to traditional medicine. And, and I've admired your work in fertility for a long time. You know, but I think it's just, you know, it's energetic as we both talk about. You know, there's this mind, body, spirit to healing. And traditional medicine and psychology, to some extent, doesn't really address the spiritual component to healing. Yeah, you know, there is a spiritual component, and the current medical model has kind of cut the head off from the, the body, and it's a mind-body. And as I've heard you share many times, and I agree with, there's a body up, um, there's a top, what is it, bottom up yeah. and top down, right? Yeah. So the physical affects the mental, emotional, your gut microbiome, your health, and the mental, emotional impacts the physical. And so if you're not addressing both, you may not get great results. And in my practice, when people came to me for acupuncture and herbs, uh, it was quite surprising that majority of them were struggling with depression, anxiety, but they were on all these antidepressants. And so I was suspicious of, the, of that approach since they were coming to me paying out of pocket to help resol to resolve that. And they're on these medications that weren't kind of giving them the joy and peace and relief they're looking for. So... I went to pursue other things, and that's how we met at a conscious workshop at Gila Golub. We met, yep. we met there, and I've trained in clinical hypnotherapy and Marissa Pierce Rapid Transformational Approach, EFT, Psyche, Bill and Banks healing, just kind, constantly trying to find ways. And, um, and Chinese medicine really understands the soul and the spirit um, in the medicine that, that there's this, we, we use the word energy, it's probably not the correct word, 
Um, but there's consciousness informa- energy because the reason I say that, Russell, is I've seen, I've witnessed remote healing. I've seen, there's research on remote healing mm-hmm. and energy dissipates with distance. And so if it was energy, it wouldn't make it far away and you wouldn't see things, you know, that the electron, the um, spooky action at a distance, you know, you spin one, the other one starts to spin at yeah. a great distance. Well, yeah, harmony, yeah. if that Resonance. was energy, the way we understand energy, that shouldn't work. And uh, so I often call it information. Like when I, when I use acupuncture or use the tools I have is I'm, I'm sharing information. The body takes it and does something with it, reorganizes it. Not me. I'm just kind of sending something um, and then the body does it. Um, and so my experience was to find other ways and... Um, I had severe anxiety. I couldn't figure out why it didn't make sense logically. Um, and, um, and that's what brought me to the conscious work. And, and, uh, but I did find something physical. It was bidirectional, but it wasn't enough to solve it. I had, I had a root canal done that, I don't know if you know the story, that went bad. Um, and I went to um, a couple of dentists that said everything looks fine from the outside and finally went to a biological dentist. And I, and I literally said, I go... I think I have this underlying infection in my jaw from this root canal. It is sore. It bothers me. And I think the inflammation is going into my brain and making me insane because I'm, I'm losing my mind. And he basically said, well, if you've had an infection in your jaw for the last year, you should have all this deterioration in the bone. So let me throw in an x-ray you. So he x-rays me. He comes back and goes, oh, my God, your jaw is deteriorated. Okay. He stuck a pipette in there, and all this blood and pus came out. Sorry for the listeners. Yep. And within 48 hours, we had that root canal pulled right out, and it was a nasty infection. So yeah. I went after it physically. That didn't resolve it, though. I still had the anxiety. And so then I went after the spiritual side. So I was doing some Chinese herbs, acupuncture, nutritional IV, and then I just decided to do the mind-body part. And that's where the shift really happened when I brought in conscious work. Yeah, same with me. You know, it was like same as like my LSD trip. It showed me that my anxiety was actually something held in my solar plexus as opposed to something that was going through my mind. I mean, basically through this, you know, Stephen Porges and the polyvagal theory, through this process of interoception, your mind is always reading your body. Always, always, always. So my mind was reading what I call what I called this background alarm in the in the body, this alarm from my childhood that never really got resolved but got stored, pushed down into my body. So my mind, being a compulsive meaning making, you know, make sense machine, had to do something with that energy. So what it did was it created all these worries. And then I believed the worries because I made them up. And then that actually aggravated the alarm, which aggravated the anxious thoughts, which paralyzed my prefrontal cortex. So I couldn't actually assess the thoughts rationally because we all have these things like we get freaked out about something. And then a day later, we look at it and go, why did I get so you know, freaked out about that when it really wasn't that big of a deal? And it's because your prefrontal cortex went offline. You know, the, the ability of your brain to kind of take the executive function and say, you know what? This worry is irrational and you don't really have to worry about it. So when that gets removed, one, we make more threat when we're in survival physiology, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine in the brain. And then we lose, we lose the actual part of our brain that would tell us that the worries are nothing to worry about. So we get hit twice. So I think that's where the spiritual thing comes in. And I think that's where when we get into these things where we have a physical ailment of some kind... And then the mind gets into this thing where it starts to compulsively worry or compulsively make sense or make structure out of the situation. We actually get in our own way. And I think one of the more, you know, one of the things about acupuncture, uh, hypnosis or whatever, it helps us get out of our own way and actually heal. Yeah, well, there's these, it seems like there's these subconscious, these these programs that we're running. And so this is the alarm because... Um, they're running and, and they're, as you said, all these stress hormones are, are being activated, which lead to chronic systemic inflammation. And from a fertility mm-hmm. perspective, that leads yep. to accelerated biological aging, premature degenerative diseases, and I believe premature fertility decline. And when you're in this alarm state that you, you talk about the polyvagal theory, um, your body starts to mobilize its resources for survival. And there, that means these resources aren't available for healing, creativity, and reproduction. 
And so I first started was looking for ways just to elicit the relaxation response, to take you out of that high beta brain waves into the alpha, relax, or from that sympathetic, the fight or flight freeze, into parasympathetic, rest and digest, um, also known as breed and feed, breed emphasis for my patients that want to mm-hmm. grow their families. And, you know, you, you find ways about playing with the vagus nerve or breath work, you know, use, not breath work, that's a different term, br- certain breathing techniques to sure. elicit the relaxation response, guide meditations, all these things. There's so many tools out there to meditation, to bring us out of that um, that alarm situation. And where I'm curious where you're at, because we talk about spirituality, and it, it kind of gets woo-woo, but I've had a... I used to have a show called Conscious Talks, and then it, it evolved into Conscious, the Conscious Fertility Podcast. And I'm bringing in physicists and psychologists and researchers. You're on the, you're on the, you're on there as well. Of course as I episode. am. <laughs> you're on there. Of course you are. And uh, and people start talking what we call spirituality, but basically there's this uh, another dimension, or a, there's another aspect of ourselves that we don't talk about in conventional medicine, and so. It seems like the tools that you're using, getting working with your younger self, the tools that I use in my practice that incorporates inner child work, younger self, um, I believe now, talk, from my own experience, what I see with the people I work with, and then all the people I've been talking to, that there's a way to tap into this sixth sense. Because um, we have the five senses, and that's kind of where allopathic medicine kind of, that's the box. Yep. Um, and there seems to be something beyond the five senses. And um, what I'm hearing and learning is that we tap into this, what they call the present moment. And when you're really in the present moment, you start to access your higher self, um, which has all human potential. And this is where healing happens. And what I see in my practice and my approach, which I call the notice, accept, choose again approach, you have resistance. So you're an alarm. You're fighting with reality. You're struggling. You're suffering. And if you're able to find this present moment, um, then the resistance drops and then flow and receptivity happens. And for my colleagues or anybody that knows about Chinese medicine, when you don't have free flow, we call it qi stagnation, and then pain, you get pain and then disease manifests. Mm. And so this resistance on an emotional, energetic level, that the t- these issues tapped in your t- trapped in your tissues, which is described brilliantly in Chinese medicine for thousands of years, um, it leads to disease. And so we want to have these flow through and leave us. They're never meant, you know, you're meant to experience pain and suffering. That's part of life. You can get frustrated, mm-hmm. you can get anger, but if you don't, if you experience it and hold on to it, as you talked about that frontal cortex and you start to rationalize and whatever, it gets trapped in your body and now it's constantly in there and it doesn't lead to good health. If you experienced it and it moved through you, it's really not that damaging. It's that we hold on to these things. And so the, when I read your book and talked to you is these are tools and techniques to help you get out of the story, and I believe you're getting into present moment and you're tapping into something beyond your brain, um, or at least your reptilian brain, the brain yeah. that's been alarmed. And and you said it really well, like when you're in that alarm, you're in a reptilian brain, so you really don't have a lot of creativity. And we know through research on gratitude even, um, that when you're fully in a state of gratitude, that you start to access parts of your brain of creativity that are not normally available to you. And so I think what I'm doing in my practice with this approach is a how to now. This is the Eckhart Tolle, you know, the power of now. Oh, I, was, yeah. I was the guy like you, you know, I think we got the left brain idea. Um, I was like, okay, this is great. I want the present moment. This sounds awesome. This sounds great. How do I, how, how do I now? Because <laughs> right. I couldn't get into the now. And I used to be a, a, a CPA. You know, I am a CPA. I don't practice as a CPA. So I just had Accountant that logical, like how people. to do this. And yeah. I realized there's a certain population that is able to sit and meditate and find their presence. That wasn't me. Hmm. I actually needed to do to get into being, which sounds counterintuitive or paradoxical, but the techniques I use are doing techniques to bring you into being, and then your action comes out of your beingness. And this beingness is in the present moment. And um, and I believe what's happening is we're lowering the resistance, we're going from the reptilian brain to whole brain, and now you start to access parts of your creativity and healing that you did not normally have um, access to. Yeah, and it's, it's about alignment. You know, we are we get this energetic alignment. You know, when you had to do the thing in uh, elementary school where they put the iron filings and the magnet, you know, it lines it up on an energy that we can't actually see. And I think that's true for us in general. And I think with so much mental illness, 
the therapy is is throwing in a medication which you know in some cases are is life-saving but it also kind of disrupts that field so as you say we lose aspects of our brain we lose creativity we lose that ability because we're in survival mode and if we're in survival mode we don't have access to creativity we don't even have access to love because the love comes from this social engagement system that we all have eye contact tone of voice prosody of voice body language facial expression now that gets shut off when you are in survival physiology when you're creating cortisol when you're creating norepinephrine in your brain when you're creating these activating compounds it's there from an evolutionary perspective to mobilize you for fight or flight so you are not almost by definition, when you're in fight or flight, able to be creative, able to sort of think outside. You go into this lower aspect of thinking and feeling to some extent, and you don't have access to that higher level. And we get trapped, and then our thoughts go in there and put the icing on the cake, and then they, they prevent us from actually getting out of that survival mode. So we're trapped in that survival mode. We can't connect. We can't connect with our social engagement system. We can't engage love and connection and support from our family, our friends, our kids, our, our, our parents. And it just prolongs this sort of agony of being separate, being lonely, being outside of ourselves. And I think when we access this spirit and we allow it to be there, the trauma will come in and try and hijack us because that's a protective mechanism we've had since we were children. But it's learning techniques and and ways of not allowing that overwhelming alarm, which has been just grooved in us for so long, to take over. And I think that's why we need to sort of do do things. And mindfulness, I think, is great. It's just you need mindfulness because you need to connect your mind and your body. And you also need to connect your adult self with your child self. And I think that's part of what anxiety or a lot of what anxiety is, is a mind body separation and an adult self child self separation. So the more we can kind of bring those things together and we can't bring those things together while we're still in this alarm state. That's the catch 22 is that you create so much alarm in your body that you can't connect to yourself. And then when you can't connect to yourself, you worry, which disconnects you from yourself even more. And it just starts this cycle of, of not being able to connect with that part of you that would actually heal you. You know, and it's interesting how you talked about this inner child part or your younger self. And so when I see um, the patients I see, majority are women because they still are the only ones, not the only ones, but they still seek out help more than men do. But we see yeah. more and more of it happening. Um, I guess our pain is getting bad enough that we're yeah, we're, yeah. We're coming. And men don't get pregnant so much. Yeah. So it's like that's what they're not going to see you for that. So. When, I, when they come in, they're working on the fertility and they're bringing up the stress or anxiety or trauma from unsuccessful fertility treatments or pregnancy losses, um, they, or the ones that come in just talking about, just about their spouse. There's usually a hit on their spouse or, they're having, right. or, they're, or there's issues with their children that's causing them pain and suffering. Sure. When we regress in, this, in the style I use, um, when they get regressed, it ends up being a memory from the inner childhood where they have the same feeling feelings. So we don't trace back the story, we trace back the feeling. And it's interesting because they've had this experience, this feeling, well before they're ever trying to get pregnant, well before they ever have kids, well before they ever met their spouse. And that's the aha moment. And then they go in and start to work on that younger self and do the tools to heal that younger self. And how I try to understand it, Russell, because I don't know if it's, it's the, I just, my brain has to has to tag it somehow, like because it bothers mm -hmm. me if I can't understand it. Although some of my teachers say it just says do the process work, have faith, and I'm like, yeah, I can't. <laughs> I, yeah. to, I need a little, I need a little understanding. So here's me from my my training as a clinical hypnotherapist. Um, I I I made sense of it that your subconscious only knows the now, and it can't tell the difference between an inner and outer experience. I'm talking about why I think the younger self or inner child modality is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when we go to a movie, we can laugh or cry, even though we know those are actors and actresses on the screen. Right. Because um, we can't tell the difference between inner and outer experience. And it only knows the now. And so when we do inner child work, to me, it's like for those that remember CDs, you know, we, we used to play music on CDs. Um, if you had a song that was playing I'm Not Lovable or I'm Not Good Enough for 50 years, sure. and I take a CD burner and I burn a new song on it that I'm whole and complete, I'm lovable, I belong, 
the next time I play that song on the CD, it doesn't matter that it played a different song every day for 50 years, it will play the new song. When you have that healing on that younger self, when that clicks, then it's like you've burned the program onto that inner child and it's as if, as an adult now, as your 50-year-old self, that adult self starts to live as if they got that childhood because the subconscious can't tell the difference. So if you start to practice younger self work, you're burning on a new program and you now start to live as if you had that. And that's why I think it's John Bradshaw says you can always, you can still have, champ, the, you know, the champion the inner child, you can still have a great childhood. So right. you get to do this work. And people sometimes think, um, you know, they think it's so silly to, to connect with their younger self. Um, but it works. Like when people come to my practice, you know, women are, you know, in their 50s and 60s and yeah. some that are trying to get pregnant in their 30s. And next thing you know, I ask them just like when, because they're worried, they're talking about something now. We're using my tools just right. like when. Next thing you know, a memory pops up that they're five and they're crying and they're there. Why? Because the subconscious only knows the now. So now they've elicited the younger self that's four or five years old. So it's happening now. They're full on tears. The difference, though, with the work that you're doing and the work that I'm doing is you're not fully at the effect of it because you're bringing awareness to it, consciousness to it. And I think of that expression I've heard many times that to transform the darkness, you bring light. Light transforms or transmutes the darkness. I interpret this as darkness is these uncomfortable feelings, these unconscious programs that no longer serve you. Light is awareness. And just by bringing awareness to the darkness, it gets transformed. So it's different than when you're in the story and you're believing it and your alarm's going off. The alarm is going off, and you would know this as a neuroscientist, the neuroplasticity of the brain, to change it, we have to elicit it, and then we have to give it a new story, right? And so, so you, 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 you re-experience it in the body, you feel it, they're yep. crying, um, and now you bring in the tools to change the story. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a lot of it. You know, I'm I'm reading a, a book called The Boy Who Is Raised as a Dog by Bruce Perry. And he's a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist. And he talks about we create these patterns in childhood, these defensive accommodations, they call it in somatic experiencing or, or coping strategies. We create these strategies as a result of trauma in childhood that's not resolved at the time that it occurs. And we run that program for the rest of our lives. It may get more sophisticated as we get older, but that underlying program is still exactly the same. And the amygdala never forgets. So the amygdala never forgets anything that's ever hurt you or anything that's really been wonderful in your life too. But mostly the amygdala is there and it's involved in just about every fear response in the brain. But it has no sense of time. So when we go back, when we regress, when we have a fight with our spouse or whatever, or it gets very heated, both of us turn into eight-year-olds. Right. We both regress into that place uh, where we felt helpless and powerless as a child. You're maturer than I am. I turn into four. <laughs> well, there, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's one of those things. So uh, we can't speak properly. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes out. And sometimes what I'll do with couples is I'll say, well, and, and Cynthia and I do this, my wife and I do this, we have a picture of each other when we're about eight or nine years old. And then sometimes when we're having an argument or whatever and it's getting heated, like I'll think of that picture or I'll go and look at that picture and think, well, that's, that's who you're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. And it, it just creates this sense of compassion because you see this little child in the other person, you know, like that little poster behind me there. And it's just, it really is... It really is something that, that gets started in the body, I believe. There's a place in our brain, ironically, I'm starting with the body, but, but there's a place in our brain called the insular cortex. And the insular cortex is kind of what mediates top down to bottom up. So it mediates the mind changing the body and the body changing the mind kind of goes through the insular cortex. So I believe that when we get traumatized as children, that insular cortex creates this emotional signature in our body. And that same emotional signature we feel now wh when as the exact same as we would have felt back then. So, of course, the same kind of powerless, helpless feeling comes up as well. So that unconscious, it lives in the moment, but it, it can transport you back into the past without you knowing it. So we get transported back in. And the other thing when you were talking was, you know, the people that I find that object most to the, the, the term inner child have, have the most inner child pain. Yeah. So it's like, I'm not going back to that stuff with, with natural resistance. So it's, our, it's often our resistance to going back and visiting the child, because that's what I was saying about the adult child 
uh, adult self, child self disconnect, we don't want to go back and visit the child because the child holds all our pain. And the child in us doesn't trust the adult in us because we've been around for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years and we haven't really taken care of them. So joining those together, finding that, that emotional signature in your body, and this is what somatic experiencing work is based on, is finding that emotional signature in your body. Where do you feel that? And can we change that feeling, feeling state at that subconscious level? Because a lot of anxiety comes from these subconscious programs that we need to change, but we can't change those things because those subconscious programs don't speak English. They don't, they don't use language. Exactly. And that's why with talk therapy, um, sometimes it, I see people that do a lot of talk therapy and I don't do counseling or talk therapy. It's not my train. I'm, I'm training. I'm training in clinical hypnotherapy and I, I have the acupuncture, but I kind of share a story to reiterate what I think I'm hearing you say this because you can't think your way through this. Um, these unconscious programs, they're imprinted on you. And it reminds me once when I was with my ch young children, when they were young, my children, um, we were at a Microsoft store, um, a virtual reality game, and I got the, I'm Spider-Man. So I got the goggles on, and I can look at my hands, and I got the spider webs, and right. I see my spider boots. And I have a fear, of, or had a fear of heights at the time. I still do, but I've worked on it a little bit. And in my mind, I'm on a beam up high up in New York on a skyscraper, and I'm meant to turn around. And... I'm trying to turn around, but I look down, and it is a massive drop, and I'm right. sweating, my heart's pumping, and I'm willing myself to turn, and I can't. I physically mm. can't. And just to let you know why you can't think your way through this, yeah. logically, I'm aware, and I'm telling myself, yeah. dude, you're, you got tape around you because they don't want right. you to hit people with the virtual right. games. Everybody's, I, there's, it's loud, people around me. My kids are like, come on, Dad, turn, turn. Do this, Dad. They're trying to coach me how to use a game. I'm aware I'm in a mall on a flat surface inside Microsoft. I know everything, how illogical yeah. this is. And yet my body, because there's the mind body, my body's yeah. saying, oh no, we're going to die here. Yeah. And that was like, this is why I think it's so cool. Why we got to go into the body, the body work. We got to go in and find these programs and shift it. And you cannot talk your way through this or think your way through this because it's in the body. Does that kind of resonate with what you were just totally. sharing? Totally. Yeah, totally. It's I, my little quote is that you can't think your way out of a feeling problem. Yeah. Oh, great. So it's yeah. the same kind of idea. And that also reminds me of the way the hippocampus and the amygdala interact with each other. So it's kind of like I always imagine a caterpillar. And the caterpillar has this huge head, and the huge head is the amygdala, and the caterpillar body is kind of the hippocampus. That's kind of what it looks like in the brain. So the hippocampus provides context. So the hip, your hippocampus would be going, hey, we're in a mall. We're in Microsoft. This is not scary. This is not dangerous. But your amygdala is saying, nope, 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 <laughs> nope, <laughs> yeah. nope. And your amygdala holds sway over your hippocampus. Yeah. Now, what you can do, and the great thing about the hippocampus is, is it's growing and changing all the time. So the hippocampus actually provides context. It's the same thing that if, when you're coming around a corner, if you're walking in a park or, 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 or a forest somewhere, and you see a stick that looks like a snake, immediately your amygdala will go and jump, and jump you back. Your body will jump back. And then you'll look at it, and your hippocampus will go, oh, context, context, context. This is actually a stick. It's not going to hurt you, but I can understand why you would think it was a snake, and then you could just walk right by it. Mm -hmm. So the thing about it is when we get traumatized as children, that amygdala becomes, that amygdala response becomes a lot stronger than the hippocampus can overcome. Now, with time and with work and with different therapies, you can build your hippocampus and create more context and create more safety. But once that amygdala is, is minted in shock and shame and fear, very difficult to change that and almost impossible to change that with just verbal, just, just learning new cognitive strategies because these cognitive, these cognitive strategies in the, in the pre, you know, prefrontal areas and the sort of more cognitive areas of our brain understand English. But the subcortical areas that mediate the, the alarm and the anxiety in the first place, pons, medulla, amygdala, none of those structures, those subcortical structures, understand language. So why are we trying to use language to change these cortical structures? They have to be changed with feeling. You know, and that's, I think that's where acupuncture and hypnosis and, the, you know, we create a different feeling and we never forget anything, but we can overwrite those programs 
more and more. And I think that's what we're doing. And I'm going to just keep going here for a second. Uh, my colleague, Arash uh, Javanbak at, uh, at uh, Wayne State University in Michigan, he has this augmented reality. Where, so he will put these uh, things over you. And if you have a, uh, a fear of spiders, it'll put you in a room. You'll look like you're in a room. And a tiny little spider will walk across the, the thing. And they'll and they will uh, monitor your heart rate and your breathing. And then over time, they introduce more spiders, and they have they actually have a tarantula in in the uh, in the university in the thing. And some people can, after these therapeutic sessions with this augmented reality, they can either go up and touch the cage or actually touch the spider itself. So it's just it's it's changing your hippocampus in real time. And I told him, I said, this is my idea. Is like, can you create a virtual reality of my younger self, of me at 12 years old, that looks like me, sounds like me, and it's from from pictures and from from audio tapes and that kind of stuff? And he says, yeah, we could do that. It costs about you know a quarter of a million dollars, but we can do it. And then I, I envision being able to actually talk in real time with the younger version of you and say, you know, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't this. And and that would provide so much context for your hippocampus that it would over start overriding that old amygdala response to immediately just fire you into fear and anxiety. Now, it was a long explanation, but I'm sure you're going to have something to say about that. Yeah, no, well, um, I want to get to the how to now part that, I, that, yep. that I'll connect this, but it, you reminded me of, I don't remember the, the episode um, on the Conscious Fertility podcast, but it's quite similar. So I want to just share this with you is they're using virtual reality in the medical field to, to, for healing. In this one case, this was just not a healing study, but it was an experiment where the students got to meet their older self, so much mm-hmm. older, 25 years right. older, and have a conversation with them. And yeah. what happened is that the students, after this interaction with them, started to change their lifestyle habits and savings because they developed a relationship with their older self and yeah. they didn't want them to have lack of money or be physically ill. And that wasn't, they, and again, they, they weren't talking about health and wellness in this study. They just got to hang out and talk to them, their 25 year older self. Yes. And as a result, they started making better behaviors today so their future self would have a better life. So yeah, it's just similar to what you said, because the subconscious <laughs> can't tell the difference between imagination, and reality only knows the now, in my opinion. And so yep. when you do this, you're changing the wiring. And that's why you don't have to think your way through this, because when you make a shift on the subconscious level, then it wants congruency and it will start to see the choices that are going to keep you congruent. So if you believe in a diagnosis, and I share this in one of my um, one of my videos on my own website about my patient that was diagnosed with fibro- fibromyalgia and she had pain and depression and fatigue. And we did a session where she got went back to her earlier self where she was healthy. She saw her future self as if it's now healthy. Um, and after that, I call that setting your GPS, by the way, setting your GPS, um, mm-hmm. as in what do you want now is if you have it, because when you drive somewhere, you don't tell it where to go. You set the destination and then the GPS tells you where to do it. So think of the GPS like your subconscious. Um, it wants congruency. And so if once she no longer had this uh, mentality that I have fibromyalgia and she set on her subconscious level that she was healthy. She experienced the physical health, like the feelings and the physicality. That was part of the experience. Mm. She shared with me when I saw her next that she joined a gym. Now, that's not such a big deal, but I didn't tell her to join a gym. She chose to join a gym, and gym would be congruent with feeling healthy, not feeling pain, depression. We know it's good for people with fibromyalgia, depression. But here's the cool part. (laughs) For the last five years, she walked by that gym to go to work twice a day, for five days a week, and she's mm-hmm. never entered the gym. After that session, she had the inspiration to join the gym. So that's the idea. Now the subconscious has a new identity. There's all these things, like you said, the thing was the amygdala can see everything, remembers everything. But if your identity is, I'm a victim, I have fibromyalgia, then you want that congruency, so you're not gonna choose things that are gonna conflict with that. So you won't eat well, or you maybe won't exercise. But as soon as she had this programming change where she is healthy, now it wants the congruency. One other example is one of the celebrities. I always, when I saw Tiger Woods blow up his life, mm-hmm. um, great golfer, um, you know, he had the, what you'd call a trophy wife. He had the money. Well, he must have been running a program that I don't deserve to have it all. So it wasn't congruent. So unconsciously, he had to mess that up. 
possibly, yeah. right? And so that's why you can't think your way through it. How do you say it? Because I love how you say that. You oh, can't, you can't think your way out of a feeling problem. You can't think your way out of a feeling problem. And the feeling problem, I believe, comes from the subconscious program. So when you shift the subconscious program, the feelings change, and then you start to choose differently on an unconscious or conscious level. And the how to now idea, or I, I take this from Viktor Frankl. He's a Holocaust survival, a survivor psychiatrist. And I took one of his quotes and I turned it into the following to to help me with what I, what I do for myself and to share with the people I see. Is in every situation, he says, um, there's a moment where you unconsciously habitually react. So there's our programs. Yep. Your younger self gets triggered, as you said. Um, or in that moment, you can consciously choose to respond. And I thought, that's great, but geez, that's a pretty fast reaction. And, you know, yes. and so what I call NAC, notice, accept, choose again, noticing you're triggered, it's about interrupting the story, right? And then accepting is using all these tools to surrender into what is, and that lowers the resistance. And then when you lower the resistance, you're out of that reptilian brain, you're in whole brain, and then you get to choose again. Now, I think what you're going to ask me is, come on, you can't do that in real time. No, you don't do it in real time. What happens is an hour later, a day later, 20 years later, when you remember an experience, now you get to use the notice, accept, choose again, and redo the story, and you're rewiring the brain. And what happens is eventually your wiring changes that your habitual reaction is the reaction you want. And so what I've seen for myself, Russ, and what I've seen for people I see I always say, you know that thing that really bothers you about your spouse or your child or at work? Mm. One day, that's going to happen again, and there's no feeling, no, no trigger. You're still going to know you don't like it, but it doesn't trigger you. And I think that's when you really find that present moment, because in Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, to summarize, at one point he says, when you're present, you can either consciously, and I use that word literally, consciously choose to respond or you can change or improve the situation. And if you can't change or improve the situation or move yourself, you can be at peace in an unhappy situation. And that's that case where you know you don't like it, but it doesn't trigger you anymore. And so the NAC, by doing this, eventually I may be with my spouse and all of a sudden now I'm triggered and I'm noticing it, but I still can't help myself <laughs> and mm -hmm. I'll still do the old yeah. stuff. But eventually I can in real time is my point. Eventually you can in real time and that's why it's a practice and you don't just do it and you're done. You're doing this and using these tools all the time and I bring in multiple tools, but to me the key is, and I'm curious what you think on this, the accepting part is that surrendering part. Um, and surrendering doesn't mean you're resigned to it. It doesn't yeah. mean you like it. It just means you're not fighting with it and that this is how I feel right now. So, for an example, we talked about shame and guilt. To accept myself for the person who feels shame and guilty right now, right? Yeah. And if I don't fight that feeling, the resistance drops. That feels like release or relief. And now I get to access more of my brain and I start to tap into that creativity and now I get to, there's a C part, choose differently. How do I want to be? And the more, and now we go back to flow and receptivity. When the resistance is down, you now have access to flow and receptivity. And so many of the people I've interviewed believe we're tapping into a higher self. There's that spiritual word now. Right. And you're, because before it's always available, but you're not, it's like clouds in front of the sun. The sun's there, but you're not experiencing the sunshine because all these clouds. And when you lower the resistance, you feel the sun. Now that the resistance is lower, you now have access. You're communicating, um, experiencing your higher self, and you have access to maybe infinite intelligence. And now your activity is rather than coming from lack and fear, your activity is coming from love or feeling whole and complete, your whole brain. And yeah. it has a different outcome usually when you act out of love versus out of fear. Yeah, I actually take people into something even beyond acceptance. Can you embrace the pain? Can you embrace the fact that you hate it when you're, you know, when your husband is brushing his teeth or chewing his food? Like, can you embrace that? Because it it does change the the neurochemistry. You know, when you embrace something. Uh, as opposed to just accepting it, when you actually bring it in and you say, I'm going to embrace this, your brain from the periaqueductal gray starts creating en enkephalins, endorphins, basically your brain's natural heroin. And it also secretes dopamine, which tells you you're on the right track. Now, if you go in there and you go, God, I hate it when he says, I, I hate this. What happens then is your body, your brain creates all this norepinephrine, it activates your brain, and you also create cortisol. 
And then what happens on top of that is it shuts off your rational brain in favor of your emotional brain, traps you in that pain, and then your natural response to that is to resist that pain. And when you resist that pain, you lock yourself into old habits that you can't get out of. So resistance is basically the the kind of the gatekeeper of being able to see things in a different way. And when you realize that you're resisting something, can you, A, first, you first you need to accept it. You can't just embrace it right off the bat. It's too big of a jump. And accept, we got to tell people, accepting yeah. doesn't mean you like it. Like people go, I don't want to accept yeah. that. We're not saying yeah. you accept it and you agree with it. It's yeah. just you have pain right now, physical pain, or you have this feeling of emotion because it's real. That is really how you feel. That's what, yeah. when we say accept, because I want to share with your audience because people are like, I don't want to accept that. And I go, I didn't ask you, do you like it or do you want yeah. to? <laughs> Can you accept that that's how you feel? Because that is how you feel right now. Like you said, and you got to lean into it, these uncomfortable feelings. That's the paradoxical thing. When you yeah. finally really accept and relax into it, and you don't need it to change, so you're not attached to a formal outcome, that's when you can change it. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. Because you know, when you em- embrace the stuff, like you said earlier, it's a lot of just like when. You know, I hate when my husband chews loudly because my dad used to chew loudly or whatever. It's usually something from your past. So if you can embrace it almost academically initially, you change your brain chemistry, you change your attitude, you no longer become a victim. When you're secreting cortisol and norepinephrine in your brain, it primes you to be a victim. So your brain will set you up for whatever you decide to do. If you resist something, you will go into pain because pain and resistance are cousins. They go together. Well, that's so chi stagnation, as, yeah, Russell, yeah, in Chinese yeah, medicine. Exactly, Resist, yeah, and and they, it, it's, I mean, it's, I don't know how to say it in Chinese, but I'll yeah. give you the English translation is, when there is no chi flow, there is pain, right? Mm. So chi stagnation is resistance. I mean, that's what we notice. We need flow yeah. and receptivity. And when we're fighting with reality, we lose our free flow and we have pain and then disease can manifest. You know, talking about the spouse that's chomping their their food. Just to show you this stuff that Russell talks about in his book and what I do in my practice, it's simple. It's so simple. Anybody can do it. It's not easy. Otherwise, everybody would do it, (laughs) but Mm -hmm. it's definitely simple. So my spouse snores um, at times as well. And I remember it was keeping me up. And then one night I was like, oh yeah, I can do self-hypnosis. So all I did is some self-hypnosis that every time I hear her snore, it allows me to go deeper and deeper into a peaceful state of sleep. And so rather than I don't want to hear it, put my head, because that's what I first right. did. I'd want to hear it, da da da, wake her up. Now I focus on the snoring as much as I can. And I'm doing some self hypnotic work where I'm using her snoring. The snoring that bothered me is now right. my signal for my body to go even to a deeper state of sleep. Like, so and I embraced it. I embraced it, yeah. right? Yeah, and it's practice, and that's the whole thing about when you practice something, you're starting to overwrite those old default mechanisms that are housed in your subcortical areas that you don't even have conscious access to. So you change the feeling around them, and when you change the feeling around them, the amygdala can sort of say, hey, this actually is safe. This isn't something I have to send out the troops for. This, this actually is safe. I'm used to it. But it takes a while, and as you were saying earlier, then you, the brain creates this confirmation bias. Okay, whenever you see something you don't like, you automatically go into, I don't like this, which, and then you will see everything else that you don't like. Mm-hmm. And that's how couples, I think, start to, start to uh, decompensate and, and, and separate is because as soon as you start seeing one thing you don't like, the confirmation bias kicks in and you, your brain just is a meaning-making, make-sense machine. It's going to look for other things that you don't like and then you're going to get this laundry list going and you know this is how couple this is how i see couples like destructure and deaminate because they start seeing one thing they don't like and then they just stack things on top of it and then it becomes more and more real this confirmation bias then um i'm curious at this um if you can explain this what i've i've observed and is when you do your conscious work, you do your inner work. So you're not trying to change your spouse. Like you can't change other no. people's behaviors. You're, you're doing your own work. And I always say right. one of two things will happen. One is your perception of the situation, the person changes. So you experience them differently. Yep. Or two is the external environment really changes or they change. And most of the people 
that's the biggest thing that the feedback is, is they start to say, my spouse is behaving differently around me. And my children, they're different. They're in, yep. in a better way. And I try to understand it as that when you heal, you're like a broadcaster, a Wi-Fi. This is the spiritual side. And that you're putting out a different broadcast. Um, and they're picking up on that. And again, it's because you're experiencing them differently. But they're like, no, no, he's cooking me dinner or he's making right. me sa- he's making me yeah. scones he, this doesn't yeah. happen right yeah. <laughs> you know this is a- so i said again you don't have to this is what the- when we when, when we met russell the biggest thing that i had in our workshop like the i, I remember this aha moment that gave me such relief because i was trying to change the world okay my spouse has to be this way my parents have to be this way my kids my staff work the world government i had so many things that needed to change for me to feel good and happy. And what I realize is the external world is a reflection of your inner world. And if you don't like your external world, then go work on your inside. And if you do your inner work, then everything else shifts. Your perception changes and you'll have a different experience. And I was so excited because I was like, you mean I only have to work on me? I can do me. I don't have to work on anybody else but me. I can make me a full-time project. And I felt so good hearing that. There's a few people I think didn't want to take responsibility in our group. They didn't like hearing that. But when I heard that, I was like, this is the best news I've heard. I only have to fix me. (laughs) I'm in control. Yeah. And I think that's true. And I think a lot of us with trauma in childhood felt powerless and out of control. So and then we adopt this victim mentality, right? So I don't see people with chronic anxiety who don't see themselves as victims. It's just, and that's neurochemical as well. Like I said, you, you create norepinephrine in your brain and cortisol in your body, and you paralyze the, the part of you that actually could change and the part of you that it could, the prefrontal cortex that could actually direct you into a different way of being. But it takes practice. And what you were saying earlier is when you change, some people won't like it. Like when you start, you know, because especially around your family. So this is the this is the paradox of healing is that when people get better with anxiety and they start seeing like, oh, I don't have to worry. They get worried when they're not worrying because worry was a way of making themselves was soothing when mm-hmm. they were a child. So we adopt these sort of strategies as children and we ride them until the wheels come off. And then our confirmation bias looks for the fact that those subcortical uh, programs are true. So if, if, you are, if you're having a bad day and something nice happens, you ignore it. If you're having, a, if you're having a, a bad day and something bad happens, it's like, this. see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So, you know, it's just you get what you see and you see what you get. And it's just knowing that you can change things without this Pollyanna, like, just think positive and positive things will come to you. Yeah, we're it not really saying that. To, they call no, that spiritual to, bypass now, I think. Exactly. But we're definitely not saying that. We're actually saying the opposite, to and notice and then accept. Um, we're saying that take up a relation with it and notice it. And that's where it's it's paradoxical. And I'll share a, a personal story where I kind of connected sure. the dots. I read Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. And as I shared, oh, I really want that, that now. Because he shared that when you're in the moment, you don't suffer. When you're fearing, when you regret the past, you suffer. And when you fear the future, mm-hmm. you suffer. If you're in the now, you don't. It's peace. It's it's bliss at times. Right. And I remember in the 90s, I was studying to be a CPA. So maybe that was part, that was clue number yeah, one. <laughs> I can't see that being part of your dharma. Yeah. It's like being, yeah, I can't clue see you one. as an accountant. But, I just can't. But keep going. But deep sadness came over me. And, um, and And I didn't really understand what was going on, but I don't know what pushed me to do this, but I decided to go in, it was during the daytime, and draw a bath. Yanni was in the ghetto blaster, put in some aromatherapy, lit a candle. I was in shared accommodation. My roommate was female, so all the lavenders and central oils were there. You already had them there. They had them there in the candles. Um, And I sat in the bath, and I just noticed where I felt the sadness in my body, and I decided just to lean into it and feel it. And all of a sudden, it's really intense, the sadness, a few tears come down my eyes, and then it transforms into bliss. It's mm. the most beautiful bliss I'm experiencing. And I'm in the bath, and I'm like, you know, noticing how amazing it is, so I try to feel sadder. <laughs> like, I try to feel sad. Right. I just couldn't even feel sad. Yeah. And it was, sorry, I had that experience first, then I read Eckhart Tolle's book. And after reading Eckhart Tolle's book, I linked what happened is I used my sadness, I used the feeling 
to become present. I, it was a portal and it brought me to presence and I no longer suffered. I just, because before I didn't want to feel the sadness. So what do you do? You know, there's drugs, there's alcohol, there's exercise, yeah. there's work. I try to numb it. And for whatever reason, I decided just to feel my sadness. And that's where my notice, accept, choose again. They're just tools and techniques to help you lean into this uncomfortable feeling and it's, I say it's counterintuitive, but as you lean into it, when you fully embrace it, accept it, it acts as a portal, the resistance just drops and relief comes over you. And now you're accessing what I believe the present moment, which is hum, um, greater potential or human potential. And, and the efforting part is, there is an effort to, but the efforting part here, this is the doing part, mm. is like if you're lifting a boulder, rolling a boulder up a, a mountain, a, um, it takes a lot of effort to roll it up. But once you get to the peak of the hill and you push it one more time, it rolls and you no longer have to push it. So the efforting isn't trying to feel better. In Michael Brown's book, The Presence Process, he says it beautifully. Don't try to feel better. Get better at feeling. Mm -hmm. And so you're efforting into leaning into this feeling. That's the boulder. And then eventually it rolls down. So you don't have to – you don't create the release. You don't um, bring yourself to presence. The efforting is, can I just stay in this physical feeling? Yeah. That's been my experience. And then the, the resistance drops. Brains go from, I believe, high beta to alpha, sympathetic to parasympathetic. And now the choose again is you're present, your whole brain. Now how do I want to be? And now I feel that's where the miracles happen. And I've seen this for a few patients on the fertility side where um, – we have some miracle babies. They actually came in like, I need a miracle baby. And yeah. I look at their chart right. and in my head, I'm like, this will be a miracle. And this is where this goes beyond what I know in mainstream medicine it makes no sure. sense, but it, they've had their miracles because they did their, their work. And then just people not even trying to get pregnant. I still see somebody that has came in with severe pain and the pain would create incredible anxiety. The difference now, remember the quote, remove yourself, change or improve. If you can't do either, you can be at peace in a happy situation. She still gets her pain, but it doesn't feel as intense in her mind, yeah. but she doesn't get the anxiety. And that has right. changed her quality of life. There is not an emotional component to the pain. Or a cognitive one. You know, that's the thing about anxiety. And that's why when people say, "Is you know, have you healed your anxiety? I say, yeah. Yeah, it's not that I don't get anxious or alarmed anymore. It's just I don't give the alarm any credibility anymore yeah. by 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 you know uh, hooking like I always imagine the ski lift. You know when you're when you're first learning how to ski, you go on that little lift where you clip yourself on and it tows you up the hill before you get on the big ski lift. But it's like I don't give the alarm credibility by just allowing it to start ruling my thoughts anymore. And I think that's a big thing is separating the alarm in your body, which is your younger self. We haven't talked too much about that. But basically, I think it's it's all pointing you back to your your resistance is I could go and, and soothe the younger part of me that's hurting right now, or I could just go into how bad this feels. Mm. And I think when you feel how bad this feels, you're actually defaulting into connecting with your younger self. So it really, and that is what, I think heals us is we create this sense that we go back to that place in time where we were wounded as children and we get a do over in a way. Yeah. If we keep resisting though, we can't. So yeah. that's the thing we, we, you can, and, and Bruce Perry talks about that in his book about, you know, seeing children with trauma, we take them back to that place and then we build them a, a roadway that they should have had when they were younger, mm -hmm. but you can build that roadway for yourself now. Now, have you lost the the momentum of you know we we develop our brains develop certain t at certain points in time and after you lose that critical period you can't really go back and heal it completely but you can heal it to such a significant extent that it doesn't rule your life anymore which is I think what you're describing with your patient and I'm describing with my anxiety is that yeah I feel it it's uncomfortable but I don't go into this horrible alarm state anymore that that drops me into victim and that drops me that that prevents my my prefrontal cortex from coming in there and going hey you know what this is temporary this isn't this isn't going to take over your life and you have a choice here as to whether or not you're going to hook on all these negative thoughts or you're just going to allow yourself to feel this situation this this the sensation even though it's horribly uncomfortable 
you can still sit with it. And when you sit with it, it has a chance to pass. But if you keep throwing matches on that fire, if yeah. you keep throwing thoughts on it, it never gets a chance to resolve. Well, that's why it's courageous work because you have to be willing to feel these uncomfortable feelings, as you said, what the, totally. the younger self has. And often in my practice, the choose again, we bring in the younger self if, if, it, if it shows up in that, in that session. But that's the key is... Um, being made able to sit with it. And I believe it acts like a portal and so much so um, to build on what you were sharing, you start to get a little bit excited when you have these feelings and you're like, what? No, really, because you, it becomes playful. Like you start to notice. So that's why I like the mm -hmm. notice part. If you can't notice you're triggered, if you can't notice you're in your program, if you can't notice your wounded child has been activated, then you can't heal it. You're at the effect of it and you're suffering. And so sometimes right. a feeling will come up and I, I have a smile. I'm like, oh, there's that program again, or here's that again. Yep. And there's a smile because I know that if I sit for a few minutes and use my NAC approach, that I'm gonna, the resistance is going to go, and I usually feel great after, right? Yeah. So Because it becomes my portal. So, you know, it just it hit me in the head, so I got to say this now. Not hit me in the head, but it popped in my head. Sure. It's hearing Bruce Springsteen once talk about um, um, how he gets anxious before he gets on on the stage. And if he doesn't feel anxious, he doesn't do a good show. Right. Somebody, I heard another um, conscious teacher talk about this and I've heard it before. Uh, Gabrielle Bernstein, a lot of people know, dear Gabby, yep. she shares um, how um, the feeling of anxiety and emotion and, and excitement are very similar. So mm -hmm. working on what you said, if you have this thought idea that this feeling is anxious, bad, more alarm. If you have this feeling, Oh, I'm anxious. I'm going to have a great show. It doesn't, you know, don't yeah. even call it anxious, butterflies. And I shared this with my son when he was young, his first public speech that he gave in elementary. And he told me how uncomfortable he was feeling. And I normalized it for him. I shared that idea that that is your body getting ready for you to give a great talk. That's the energy. It's like, at a, you know, at the car, when the car's like, at the, at the, before the gut, like, goes yep. green, he goes, yeah. And I go, that's your body getting ready to do a great show. If you feel nothing, you may fall flat because you don't. You need the energy. Yeah. And do you, and I said, do you know your material? Are you ready? He goes, I do know it. I go, here's my promise to you: if you're willing to feel that uncomfortable feeling that you're describing, the butterflies, as he described it, one minute into your talk, it will disappear. And you're gonna have the best time of your life. You just have to be willing to sit through that one minute. And again, we change the perspective of what that means. Those butterflies. Oh my God, it's bad. And so there's anxiety. Oh my God, I'm going to have a great show. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's what you were just sharing there. Yes. Yeah. I'm ex I was exactly the same way with stand up. you know, like before you just sort of open the curtain, you know, to come, they introduce you or whatever before you, before you're, if I didn't have a lot of anxiety, it was trouble. Like I knew it was like, I wasn't getting, my brain wasn't going to be as sharp. And it's that kind of that critical point where you need activation, but once the activation goes above your window of tolerance, then it starts becoming, you know, it degrades your performance as opposed to augments it. So I know exactly what that feels like. So it's really, yeah, for me, it's just trying to find that version of me that was scared, that was afraid, that, that, that just like when moment and going back and can I find that, that part of me? through my body, through the sensation in my body. For me, it's in my solar plexus. You know, can I reassure that place? Can I breathe into it? Can I stay with it? I know it hurts. And this is where, you know, we do need other people to help us. I mean, we work on ourselves, but I think, you know, it's the fundamental thing of like when a baby's born, doesn't really know the difference between itself and its mother for the first six to 12 months, right? So its mother becomes the, the sort of the overlord as to how this body's nervous system is going to develop, this baby's nervous system. So if the mother's stressed, you know, the baby gets stressed. And it's really important to, to be able to go back almost in that way and say, okay, you didn't get this level of connection that you needed. And maybe your parents were good, but you were just a very sensitive child, which I was, and they couldn't provide you with the level of, of connection that you needed. But you can do that for yourself. It takes practice, though, because there's so much resistance to actually feeling good. If you spent your life in, in anxious worry and, and getting yourself ready for some sort of trauma or, or, or trouble, it's very difficult to start trusting calm. And that's why it takes practice. That's why you just do it over and over and over again. And that starts to rewrite the old program. And that's why a feeling of safety 
is so important in your healing, just to feel safe. And you can learn, you know, coming full circle, you can learn to feel safe, even though you have this alarm. Absolutely. And that's where I, I love it. Eckhart Tolle is you can be at peace in an unhappy situation. And yeah. so um, your experience of it has changed because you have changed. And it does take some conscious work, inner work. Um, and I often bring in the younger self, inner child work. Um, my, I never try to find it. I know like in your style that you look for it because I'm a lazy doctor. I'm like, oh no, I got to deal with your inner child. <laughs> but, well, you, you got to be careful. You know, I, in medicine, I couldn't do that because I had seven to 10 minutes with a patient. So, yeah. so now I have more time to kind of let's, let's find this in your body because I do feel that this yeah. alarm that's in your body is your younger self yeah. asking for your attention. And it will get louder and louder and yeah. louder if you keep ignoring yeah. it. It, so, it shows yeah. up when it's ready. Because I, I know some colleagues, because this has become popular, your book has helped right. the younger self become popular. So they'll come in and they're like, we got to find that wounded child. And I'm like, we'll work what's happening today. And I just gently, just like when, as an earlier time, and then, no, then we just continue on. And, and somewhere in one of the first couple of sessions, it comes up, right? Yeah. But I don't... Um, look for it because again i'm not doing counseling or therapy i'm doing conscious work i'm doing some clinical hypnotherapy and so um we're just we're i whatever shows up shows up and i just facilitate because they're doing the work and and there's that trust that it comes up when it's meant to come up i remember working with yeah. somebody it was close to a year and she made some um great changes great improvements in her life health um and, and emotionally but she didn't remember much before age of six and then mm. Similar session, just like when, and the same memory kept on coming up, you know, after six. And I just said, just like, you know, we traced the film, just like when, and then it went pop, and now she's four, and now yeah. she has a very bad memory. Um, and that's where hypnosis and help dissociate and do the yeah. tools and heal it and all that. So they're like, you, like we, your full circle idea, sometimes medication is required. I don't know if medication is a solution, but medication can create enough space and give you some safety so you can work on yourself. So yeah. we used some clinical hypnosis tools so it wasn't so intense and she could come alongside that self. And then that was her big healing moment when she did that, right? Yeah. Um, but it came up when it was ready. To, like, I, I guess listening to your earlier and knowing your book, that inner child just did not trust her forever. So we just like went no. never, never. And she just kept on working, working. And then one day... I'm saying what I think might happen. The inner child's like, I think she's really means it. She's really here. She's really sticking around. Mm. She's not leaving. You know, I've been waiting for this for a while, um, but forever just could not show up. And then it just said, okay, here I am. <laughs> Here's our memory. Yeah. yeah. And I don't go after the inner child directly. I go after the, the, the sensation in the body. Yeah. And that's why when we're the same that way trauma, then, because I just say, yeah. follow the feeling, not the story, follow the feeling just like when, and then whatever comes up. Yeah, because before seven, you know, we don't have a lot of verbal uh, competency before seven. So we don't often have a story, a cognitive story anyway. It's the story of the body. And we, we don't have to know the trauma. We just have to know where we feel it in our body. And knowing that often will bring different sensations, images, memories, uh, all this kind of stuff up to the surface when it's ready. And like, like I said, I definitely agree with that. But, you know, I don't go directly at the inner child. I go at the sensation in the body right. because I believe that, that that is the royal road to the inner child. But it's, it's working with that. It's working with the alarm sensation first and trying to soothe that because I think what happens is when you start soothing the alarm in the body, the that's where the child in you starts gaining trust that you are on the right track. Yeah. You are you are here to help me now. You're not just sort of going to push me away again. So, you know, I mean, we, you and I could talk forever about this, but but where do people find? Or is there something you want to sort of you know uh, encapsulate before? I'll, the, I'll I, say I, that I, the tools that you're hearing here, that like Russell's been sharing in his podcast, in his book, and what he does in his work, um, and just other people doing this kind of conscious work. They're tools to help you have emotional resilience. That's really what it is. And that gives you confidence. So you now know, rather than trying to control life, your environment, it needs to go this way so I'm safe, you start to have emotional resilience and confidence knowing that it doesn't matter what's happening in my external environment, I can deal with this. And so that's what these, I guess that's what I can say I like about these tools and what you're sharing is they give you the emotional resilience and confidence that you can handle life. Um, and to find me, 
Um, I have the Conscious Fertility podcast, so look for that. Check out Russell's episode on it because we tied into reproductive health, so that's a good one. And Russ talks a lot about um, Stephen Porges. We have an episode with him from the polyvagal theory as well and many other um, conscious um, leaders in the field. So check out that. And then um, I have uh, AccuBalance. AccuBalance.ca is my clinic um, where I do all kinds of things, but it's well-known for fertility. And then I have my website, laurenbrown.com, where I put up videos of our podcast. So you and I chatting is on a video as well. Um, But I guess to find me, I would go to the AccuBalance website or the Conscious Fertility Podcast, and I'm on Instagram under Lauren Brown Official. Wow. Lots of ways of of finding him. So that will wrap up this episode of the Anxiety Rx Podcast. I thank Lauren for being here with me today, and I'm sure we will talk again. So thanks, and join me next time.